the big mistake a lot of beginner writers make is they say, I want to write about productivity tips. And so they start writing blog posts on their own blog that no one's going to read, no one's going to navigate to. And they give what I call commodity advice. It's here's how the Pomodoro technique works. Here's how the Eisenhower matrix works. And all those things are great, but a reader comes across their profile and asks a single question. Why should I care what you have to say? And if you don't have any credibility, whether it's external, like a large number of followers or a large amount of posts that show you've kind of put in the work to get here, people are not going to pay attention. And you can either think that's unfair or accept that. And so instead, you need to build credibility, borrowing it from a bunch of experts or saying something so specific that you're the only person that could be credible on that topic. You say, here's how 10 billionaires use the Eisenhower matrix, how to use the Eisenhower matrix for middle market SaaS portfolio managers. So you kind of strike this balance where you're attracting a general audience interested in productivity and a niche audience interested in productivity through a specific lens. And that you kind of have the spectrum and that's how you get the ball rolling. Ideas come to me throughout the week. I capture them all everywhere. So I think the fundamental thing is being able to capture ideas wherever they are, get them out of your head. So I have post-it note next to my bed, a whiteboard in the shower, a whiteboard over here, a whiteboard when I'm working out, quick capture on my phone, like all these inboxes that I can just capture ideas. Then I very specifically try to find golden nuggets when I'm listening to things, not take big long notes on whatever it is, but I go into everything, every interaction, every conversation, every every podcast episode looking for just one thing that I think I could apply to what I'm doing. Because what the internet has done is basically democratized access to opportunity. You do the right things on the internet and you open up such unbelievable upside and opportunity. And that's almost paralyzing to a lot of people to even start sharing ideas or writing or starting a podcast or a business, right? It's, I know there are so many other people who have done this. So it's, it's like a mix of fear of failure and a mix of fear of success. I don't want to do this and fail, but I also not sure if I want to do this and experience all that upside. It's truly a way to unlock just serious, serious upside. And I think that it weighs on people from putting themselves out there online. Sean Peary has this great framework of, he calls the ABZs, which is you need to know where you are, which is A, you need to know Z, which is kind of where you want to end up. And then you need to know B, which is the very next step to get there. And a lot of times Z ends up changing once you take B, but most people get so caught up in, I don't even know what Z is. I don't even know where I am. How am I ever going to get started? So my advice is to just get started because the rest will solve itself. The easiest way to do this is pick a topic you want to learn, go curate 30 articles and podcasts on that topic learn each of them and distill them and publish your summary or distillation or whatever it is every day for a month. And there's no downside to doing that. It's pure upside and you could get started on it tomorrow. Most people get way too caught up in the infrastructure. They think, oh, do I need Circle or Slack or Discord or where do I host this? And to me, that is all procrastination. If you have a high quality community, people very excited and you're delivering high quality content, you could host it on Facebook groups and it would do just fine. So I'd say spend a little bit less time worrying about your infrastructure and more on your community. Digital leverage is the idea that you can have an army of employees spread out across the internet working for you for free 24 seven all the time. And none of them are humans. The landing page for Ship 30 right now is an employee whose full-time job is to tell people about the course and sell them on it. I have an email course that is working 24-7, 365 to deliver some kind of value. Every single one of the, those things used to take a human. Like that is the unlock, right? Mm. It's kind of wild to think about, but Think about passing out flyers for something you were selling back in the day. Now anyone, billions of people can see it. So I like to think at any given moment, I'm training an employee in some way. When I'm writing a Twitter thread, that's a new employee. That's going to live forever working for me for the rest of eternity for free. So digital leverage is just this idea that robots can work for you for free forever and you should spend your time hiring and training them. I sit down and say, who am I writing to? What problem am I solving? Why is it a problem? And then I try it every single time to write for one person. I call this pinpoint writing, which is you pinpoint the exact person you're writing for, what value you're providing them and what benefit you're unlocking for them. And then the rest writes itself. It's easy to get caught up in like, oh, how do I grow as a writer? It's the same way that any product grows. The easiest way to grow as a product is to solve a problem really well for a customer where they're going to go tell everyone else. 
So as a writer, you should take that same approach of if I solve a problem for someone, they're going to go tell everyone about it. And then I don't even have to worry about distribution or marketing or whatever it is. This idea I think about a lot is kind of the internet benefit spectrum. Pretty much everything you do falls somewhere on the internet is helping you or it's hurting you. And for a lot of people, their information diet is either extremely poor or extremely high quality because of the internet. And it's those that invest the time in curating their Twitter feeds and finding interesting blogs and using the tools that are out there and saving notes from all these places that are seeing all the benefit. And then it's the people who are beholden and enslaved to the algorithm and only being served what they think should be served to them that end up doom scrolling and arguing and what have you. The number one thing you can do when you write a headline or any kind of hook is clear, not clever. On the internet, you're not competing with other writers. You're competing with TikTok and Netflix. And what that means is your reader has a very, very short amount of time that they're willing to be confused. And so instead, you want to clearly say, what is this? Who is it for? And what is it doing for me? I have a framework for this called the marathon pacer. Going into a marathon, you have pacers running along with big signs on their back that say a certain time. And what they did was they asked people going into the marathon, what's your goal? What pacer are you going to keep up with? And everyone wrote it down. They said, my goal, I've been training for a long time for an eight minute mile marathon. I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. And what they did was they took those pacers and they sped them up by 10, 10 seconds a mile, something like that which over the course of a marathon comes out to a pretty good amount, right? And I think something like 95% of people ended up running faster than they were just because the pacer they were following that they thought was running at the time that they were supposed to run ended up running faster, right? So the eight minute pacer going at 745, they're like, oh, I'm running eight minutes. I feel fine. I feel fine. And then they, they get to the end. They're like, holy shit, I just ran a 745 marathon. So my framework for this is finding out what your marathon pacer is right now. Who are you looking at? Who are you comparing yourself to? Who are you thinking is setting the bar for you? Is that the right marathon pacer for you? And once you recognize that you could jump ahead to the six minute one and see what happens, the more often you try to keep up with someone a little bit faster than you think you can handle, you're gonna surprise yourself. If you're writing online and you are only writing for what people will respond, you are not going to last. Michael Jordan played for the process and not the result. The championships he won were merely a byproduct. If there were no fans, I could guarantee you he would still be playing just as hard. With writing online, it's you need to write as if no one was reading and be okay with that. So it's almost a, a selfish writing where you do it for yourself and for what feels right to you. The byproduct is, is really great writing. It's funny how those go together. It's funny how the writers who do write for themselves and who clarify the way that they think, the result is such good writing that it's inevitable that you build an audience and, and gain an authority. Yeah, that, that really is my biggest advice to people who ask about, you know, how should I get started? It's pick something that you know you can do for a certain amount of time that's long enough to go past the point where most people quit. And that if you go all the way and make it to your date that you say, I'll give up by then, there's no downside to making it all the way there. I say all the time that consistency creates competence and there is no one out there who has written 52 shitty newsletters. They either write 10 and give up or they write 52 and figure it out along the way. So you have to pick something where you give yourself enough time to learn that has a little downside. And I really think that writing every day for 30 days, whatever it is you wanna write about, whatever topic you have is the easiest way to do that. Who would you rather, if you were selling a product, have share something? Fox News or Logan Paul? You know, power is going to accrue to the individuals. The friction that has required cooperation in the past gets melted away where it's very easy. Like I have a bounty for a job that needs to get done. I can put that out there and very seamlessly someone picks it up. You are going to have to have a non-commodity skill set through some level of specificity or otherwise you're going to work for Amazon. I, I think Jack Butcher tweeted it. We're all either artists or working for Amazon in, in 50 years. And artists are not necessarily art in the sense, but more something that you can't teach a computer to do very easily with any kind of level of uniqueness. You're either going to accept that I need to 
do something on my own as an individual, or I've just become a cog in, in kind of a long-term machine. You should spend hours of time seriously looking at what am I reading every single day? What am I listening to? I mean, I think of my podcast feed as one of my greatest assets, where for some podcast to make its way onto that, I'm going to listen to it if it shows up there more than likely, right? So I have to be very intentional about that. The blogs, the people I follow on Twitter, you're you're basically letting other people program your mind. And when you realize that, you you kind of think a lot differently about who you're following, what you're reading. I think the only way to have slow growth as a writer is when you're ignoring what the market is telling you. If you're having slow growth, it by definition means you're saying things that the market is not that interested in. And that's coming from a selfish assumption that you know what the market wants. So instead, we talk about ego-driven writing versus data-driven writing. With a data-driven writing approach, you're listening to what the market tells you with everything you hit publish on. That's going to accelerate your feedback loop versus this kind of, I'm going to retreat into the woods for 18 months, write my grand masterpiece and emerge, you know, like uh, Hemingway used to do or whatever it was. The unsustainable way to kind of do things online is to get dopamine from the results. And I took a step back the other day and did a dopamine audit of thinking about where am I kind of mindlessly refreshing things? And it, to be totally truthful, the top of that list was, was Twitter notifications and Gmail emails and things like that where you're getting attention. I'm turning it now from dopamine from the result to dopamine from the process and really trying to hype up every time I hit publish and then mute the notifications on that thread, right? Training myself a little bit more to this more sustainable, don't focus on the result, focus on the process, which is cliche at this point, but it's, it's, it's so true. Every single person is sitting on a treasure trove of information that has become almost unaware to them because of how obvious it is. And so we call this the two-year test, which is you want to look back on the last two years of everything you've done and think about what problems you've solved. Because the best writing and the clearest writing, the ones who see the most growth are the ones who are solving a specific problem. So you look back on the last two years and say, oh, I used to have this problem. Now I don't. I used to be at this point in my career. Now I'm here. And then that experience, you can dive into a thousand different ways.